The, the actual weirdest experience in my sort of little investigation was not the sex robot, although that did feel weird, but the uh, virtual reality porn. And um, when I went into this, it's a classic example of this form content thing, because I was primed as a sort of leftist, you know, uh, I was primed to hate this because, you know, it's really quite typical. I expected it to be uh, a certain kind of misogynistic thing or whatever. Uh, and I went in sort of primed to think, you know, this is going to be bad. But I tried to tell myself, don't go in with any opinions, right? Just just see how it goes. Now, there's two kinds of VR porn that dominate the market. I don't know how much you guys watch of this stuff. Probably none. Um, but this was probably because you can't afford a headset. You know, that's the, that's the main reason. People... <laughs> that's the reason I didn't uh, until this point, I suppose. But um, anyway, you, you, you've got two types. One's um, like your, uh, your camera. So basically, you put the headset on and you're basically a camera. And you're, you're not in the room personally, but you look around the room just like you look around a screen, but uh, you just see it in 3D. The other kind is the POV kind. And in some of these things, you quite literally put on a headset and you put on another man's cock and everything. And you see the world from <laughs> the perspective of the thing. And you literally, I mean, one can easily have fun with psychoanalysis about what kind of castration is going on here in this quite literal sense or whatever. But the weird <laughs> thing was, I found it. Obviously then you're, you're this sort of, you go in there, suddenly you're like some it's like Andrew Tate type doing your sex on these women and so on. Um, uh, from the, and you, you temporarily, get, and so at the level of content, right? I don't think this is particularly helpful or whatever. I would probably criticize the content if I was forced to. But at the level of form, I can honestly tell you, it's a quite astonishing experience. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground. Welcome, Alfie. How's it going, man? Hi, guys. Yeah, good. How's it going? Good to have, good to be here. I didn't realize uh, you had this sort of guest salad going on. Uh, yeah today <laughs> the guest salad it's how guest i like salad. to do think... things <laughs> well no because pete uh, was pete was pete just on yes yeah uh-huh yeah, okay cool no, he's, he's a good friend of mine and then uh, i noticed you had others i was thinking what would i be in the, in the guest salad probably the the onion or something <laughs> and then you've got nina and ben later this sort of little bit of a spicy vinaigrette putting on the top at the end <laughs> Yeah, so let's see. It's uh, the, the the whole day goes. Peter Rollins, Ted Reese, Nor Hariri. Uh, oh, the, right. now it's she's now great. it's yeah, she's awesome. And now we've got you for for this for this session. After that, it's going to be Cadell and Owen, followed by Daniel Garner of OG Rose, followed by Ashley Frowley, then Nina, then a surprise. The surprises, I have multiple things that might go on these surprises, and then there's also a, a, a guest that might pop in. Um, and then finally, there'll be uh, Benjamin Studebaker, who I've not actually had an opportunity to collaborate with or even be in dial. I've, we've never talked before, so, but okay. Oh, he's let's, awesome. No, he's awesome as well. He's just done, you know, I have this, uh, I, I know I mentioned to you before, I have this um, like pamphlet publishing house. Um, right. And Benjamin Studebaker did a fantastic pamphlet for us recently, like about uh, the question of the revolutionary subject and what that means today and stuff. I really, really liked it. I think he's, he's great. Awesome. Um, well, so let's let's back it up for a second, because this is not just a live stream. It is also that this is on YouTube and Twitch. But, you know, more importantly, all of the stuff that I make is for people to check out in the future. You know, it's for workers with earbuds and Autodidacts who just, they're probably reading or working or something right now who can't get to it. And so this will, get, this will first of all, be in the long form. People can always binge the long thing, but it's also going to get republished as a standalone video. So I want to properly set you up then and assume an audience that doesn't know you or your work. And so uh, as your mug there in your hand just said, you're with Sublation Magazine. In fact, Doug Lane handed off uh, the major, or I guess the soul, or at least the main responsibilities to you. Uh, and so you run that and you do the, this uh, pamphlet publishing. I've been seeing these really sexy volumes. Uh, you said you're gonna give me one recently, but basically these are 
Uh, I mean, you've got all kinds of contributions from obscure authors as well as you got this recent one out with Slavoj Žižek on chat GBT, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's right. I, I edit Sublation Magazine. I, I, I've been, along with Doug, Doug Lane and Ashley Frawley, I've been part of, of working with those guys for years, but now I mainly work on the magazine uh, while, while Doug and Ashley do the, the podcasting and, and YouTube network. And then um, we're all kind of involved in the, the publishing press side of Sublation as well. Uh, and then, yeah, these little tiny little pamphlets. This one's by Ian Parker. Uh, this is my other personal project, really. Every, it's called Everyday Analysis. Uh, but they're very, um, they're little pamphlets. We have them, yeah, as you say, from people like Zizek, but also from new authors and stuff like that. And the idea is to, we, we give the digital ones out for free and we charge like just five quid, six dollars or whatever for the little print ones just to cover like printing and costs and stuff. But the idea is kind of like to revive a bit of like pamphlet culture really like short form easy to read but like philosophy and theory and just get them out there and stuff and host host events in the pub uh which i'm happy that you guys will be uh, uh co sort of collaborating a little bit on one of those in the future as well but it's, it's great fun to do so yeah those are the two projects really that i uh i do at the moment awesome and so we will be doing something and i would just i just uh said in the previous segment uh it, the there's not a lot of for sure dates for the European tour. Uh, we know where we're coming in and we know where we're leaving from. And we know that we'll be in London from May 4th through the 6th, unless we can't do it on the 6th because of that holiday. So have you got an update about that yet? Um, my guess is it won't affect it and it should be fine. So as soon as I know, uh, confirmed from the venue, we'll, we're you know, looking forward to having you. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. And so with that, I, I, mean, well, I this was not going to be so much focused on what we're doing in London as one of the special interviews itself, like a sort of meeting that's been a long time coming because I've heard a lot about you. Um, Nance here actually has put you on my radar um, and has read a bunch of your work. Nance is also uh, the student who's done everything at Theory Underground and is a uh, regular participant of the critical media theory cohort. He's got a presentation coming up in a week. Um, hope you're not too stressed about that one, Nancy. Yeah. <laughs> Reminder, um, homework due. No, um, do you, so Nancy, you, I, I know I could sit here and I could rattle off some of the books that Alfie's written and that's the, the standard thing that a, a, an introducer does, but I want to give you an opportunity to say a couple things about like you told me that Alfie wrote a book about sex and robots or sex with robots and that he had sex with a robot. Could you elaborate? Is that true? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't get to that part yet. <laughs> sort of. It depends what you call. It depends what counts as sex, but yeah, you know, <laughs> cool. So in relation to critical media theory and everything we've been doing at theory underground, Nance, do you want to say a few things about why you're interested in uh, Alfie's work before I, start pulling out the questions. Just I like it, it uh, discovering, I can't remember the, the name of that book now, the, but discovering like that sex was dreams? exciting for me. Was it um, Sex Dreams? Is it called Sex Dreams? That's the Dream Lovers one, yeah. Dream Lovers, there, Dream yeah, Lovers, yeah, yeah. there we go. Sorry, yeah, that's um, right. Yeah, that was, that was really exciting for me. Um, it. I don't know, I guess probably came at the, at the right time. Um, but it was like a fresh, a fresh take and, and your, your dedication to engage with, um, the topic that you were writing about, um, was, was fresh and exciting for me. Um, I think that's why I liked it so much. And that's probably why I was like gushing over it today for, for a while. Um, that's great. That's fun to talk about. Yeah, no, I'm happy to hear that. So with that, yeah, then I, mean, I, I, oh, well, yeah, no, I mean, let me just say quickly about that. I mean, like, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I know uh, when we spoke before, you had not necessarily some criticisms, but some questions. And I think it is really interesting to like also reflect on, um, you know, I'm very interested in, in the stuff I'm doing at the moment with like what the left is and or whatever. Uh, and I think I, I did kind of write that a slightly more sort of well a different sort of time. So I, I'd like to sort of maybe reflect on that a little bit as well, since we're talking about it. But yeah, ju just to give you the sort of um, yeah, just to respond to what Nan said, I think it's really interesting. Uh, just to give you the sense of what I wanted to do there, it's like 
you know, I, I wanted to do a, a book which explored how relationships are, are changing in the digital age, basically. So my idea was to like use um, psychoanalytic theory to think about the question of desire. And um, and I suppose also the, well, the concept from Jean-Francois Lyotard, which is of this desire revolution. So he got it sort of claims that in the 80s, there was this kind of revolution in desire that was taking place. And I sort of wanted to suggest or explore the idea that there was another kind of desire revolution taking place today. Um, and that this revolution was like in process rather than complete. And I wanted to sort of explore the ways in which technology was changing how we think and feel, how empathy works, how identification works, how recognition works, uh, and, and in a broader sense, how love works. I guess that's what I was trying to sort of think about. Um, but also like, yeah, like you said, I, I wanted to do this not just from, I felt like I couldn't do this just from the sort of, you know, reading The Guardian or whatever. So I had to like, properly have a go and you know I can I mean it depends what you want to talk about but I so I did things like I got a virtual reality girlfriend and an AI girlfriend I went to virtual reality porn brothels and sex robot brothels and I thought I should just give these things a full go and, and actually <laughs> immerse yourself fully into these things and I had some pretty weird experiences and, and I did come out with some weird thoughts so you know it was fun to do and, and I think worth doing rather than just um you know sitting on your, in your academics office uh, talking about what you think these things might be like there were some really surprising results uh, and i didn't feel afterwards like i i thought i would right that's 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 not the part i got to in the book <laughs> right i didn't get to that part yet I've, you but you've whetted my appetite and honestly you know in terms of in terms of the attention economy and clickbait like if you were to rewrite this, you should probably lead with I fucked a robot. Like maybe title <laughs> title the book that. Honestly, I think it would probably sell a few million more copies. People would be like, this guy fucked That's a funny. robot? I, I saved it for the, the thumbnail for your video, guys. <laughs> Perfect. There we go. I will actually use that. Yeah. Um, and it's going to have a little arrow pointing right at you. You know, it's going to be like, I fucked a robot it's pointing at you. <laughs> you know, I mean, at... I just, dude, it, I think it, like, there, there was, there have been quite a few, I don't know, people writing about the gamification of relationships and, and all that stuff. And, like, it, it was kind of boring. It's like, well, yeah, of course. Um, and people were kind of sitting back and, and writing about it from their offices and to actually be able to, like, no, this is, this is something important that's happening. Um, and for you to kind of close the distance, I think, is what distinguishes your book from some of the other works out there that are really just about like the gamification of social relationships nowadays. Yeah. Which yeah, is an yeah. important topic. And, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I hope that's the case. And, and also, um, yeah, it connects to the other thing I was trying to say about this question of the left and the right. Right. Because what I was thinking about when I went in with that book is who is this revolution going to serve? Right. Like uh, and, and of course, the obvious example to that is it serves capitalism and it, so, it serves a new form of digital corporation who in whose interests it is that our desires be nudged and modified in, in such and such a way as to take us in, in different directions. So, um, you know, one very quick example of that was a story I always got to tell when I talk about this book is that this time when I went to China to uh, and I, I gave this talk about WeChat and how sort of evil WeChat was. And at the end of this talk, like these two guys in suits like came up to me and I thought, oh shit, like this is gonna be like Tencent's lawyers or something. And it was actually, these guys were like, oh, we're from, we're from Alibaba. And Alibaba was like the second biggest tech company. I thought, oh bollocks. Uh, and they said, oh, you, you hate Tencent, right? And I said, oh uh, yeah. And they were like, oh, you, you probably love us. You know, we're their enemies. You know, we're Alibaba, you know. And I sort of said, well, no, no, you got this wrong, right? You're both evil and all that, you know. But they, they didn't care, obviously, what I thought. And they said, why don't you come with us to this place called Cloud Town, uh, which is on the outskirts of Hangzhou in eastern China. Uh, and I said, great, you know, but you know I'm just going to write about how bad it all is, you know. And they didn't care about that. It just goes to show, you know, lots of our assumptions about this stuff, especially in China, isn't right. But the thing, uh, when I was there, I asked the guy to show me, like, they, get, they got all this stuff, right? They, they got, like... For example, traffic lights, which count the wrinkles in your face and decide how long you're going to need to cross the road based on how old you are and stuff like that. Um, and I said anyway to them, like, oh, what's the most impressive thing you've got? And they um, they said, well, it's this car. 
And they showed me this car and it looked normal. It's um, co a co-manufacturer from Alibaba and Rover, the car company Rover. And I said, like, what's so impressive about it? And I was expecting the guy to say, like, oh, it's the fastest car in the world. It's the car that can never crash. It drives itself, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't use any fuel or whatever. And he said, the car knows when you're hungry and what you might like to eat before you do. And it drives you there. Um, and at the time, I thought nothing of this. I thought, why would anyone care about that? Um, but actually, after thinking properly, I realized that this is more important and more impressive than than the other stuff, because what this car was designed to do was basically read your whole history of data, your credit card receipts, Instagram photos of food you share, etc. And you might not realize that at four o'clock on Tuesday, you fancy sushi, but the car realizes. And then at 3.40, it says, what about this place or whatever? And what they were doing was redirecting people from restaurants which take cash to ones which take Alipay uh, or away from ones which to go back to the rivalry with Tencent take WeChat Pay. And now that's not that doesn't sound like the end of the world, right? It's just a payment method. But it is a kind of clue to the kind of dystopia we're sort of moving towards where, you know, if you think about the riots of May 68 and where the left comes from in this sense, they, those people believe that liberating our desires would be the same as liberating us. Today, we're in a, a place where it's precisely through our drives and desires and impulses that we are controlled by corporations, by capitalists, by industry or whatever. So we have to rethink what it actually means to be free and what it means to think about the left and desire and things like that. And that's the sort of thing I, I was trying to sort of uh, reflect on what, what the left means in all this, you know, and then ultimately, you know, Who's going to win this revolution in desire and, and for what, you know? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of, you, you preempted so many of my questions here, but I want to say in my defense, I was going to ask you a bunch of theory questions before asking you these, these more like, <laughs> okay, so it, it, the, the blunt version of the question was going to be like, so why did you write this book only for leftists? Which was mm -hmm. sort of like the clickbaity way of, uh, summarizing a discussion that I had been having over the course of several hours uh, with my wife as she was reading this book to me while I was driving on a road trip um, because she is going through what she calls her questioning everything and especially the left era and so this is her era you know and and she's and she's especially questioning um, whatever she comes across something that is just like it's all framed as well the only you know, deserving audience for an author's point is people who want to have all of the box boxes ticked. And so at the time you were writing, you were like saying things like, well, and this is going to especially impact the neurodivergent and the trans and the this and the that. And you're going through all the, and it's just like, okay, we know, but also like, what about people who aren't like, you know, all the way down the line, checking all these boxes in on every little thing that the left is supposed to care about today. And so when I've reached out to you, we, we were talking and I was like, is it cool if I ask you about that? And you're like, yeah, man, I'm totally fine asking about that. And I want to get to that, but I want to first, because you said that a lot has changed since the Bernie Corbyn era. And I would say for me as well, uh, we can get into it. We can get into it, but I want to focus instead on data, uh, datafication of objects versus objectification of data. I, th I think that was a really interesting thing. Could you explain what that distinction is getting at and maybe use some examples? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, God, uh, that, uh, yeah, so, so let me think about that for a second. I mean, yeah, it's, it's from, uh, it's actually a distinction I think I stole or borrowed from uh, the, a really interesting theorist, Yukui, um, uh, who, um, but I mean, again, this it all does kind of connect um, uh, to this question of the left and, and things because and the question of the right because um, where I was where I actually sort of came into this was looking at online dating sites and how um, well yeah I mean I actually tried to look at sort of um, how politics kind of operates like I mean the, the silly example is Trump dot dating yeah um, which I don't you remember that like it was actually in the news because the guy who was chosen as the model turned out to be like a sex pest or something uh, and then 
<laughs> but, but there were actually two um, Trump dot datings, and and there were uh, two. Uh, there were there are leftist dating ones. Uh, uh, there's something called OK Comrade, which I don't think is out yet. There was a uh, one called Red Yenta that was meant to come out, and one could easily say that you know this has always been the case. You know the liberals go on Guardian Soulmates, the the righties go on or whatever, the Christians go on Christian Harmony or whatever. So you know I wanted to explore how this sort of system of dating this idea that there are certain patterns in what we want and we want to see for certain I, I can't you know this this was there's a lot that one could say here but basically to put it really briefly um the idea that what we want is a reflection of ourselves and we sort of group together in these kind of narcissistic bubbles of people um actually starts with the algorithms of dating and so on and 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 uh and it's actually it's very interesting how it works because and i think there's a sort of metaphor there that this is actually how society uh, digital society works at large i mean you know how facebook friend suggestions work how uh, you know little groups of podcast listeners work and parasocial relations between people is totally transformed and it's actually causing a lot of division and, and divisiveness or whatever so i think um you know that this is kind of what Yuqui, that he's extremely, he's one of the best philosophers in the world, in my opinion. It's extremely hard to read, but but he's the best media theorist who's currently writing, I think. And he's, um, he, he talks about these two things, right? So one is like how we become objects, how we become digital objects in the world. Uh, but the second, maybe more important, is this sort of process of... Um, the, 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 the how, how the datification of objects, how we are put together in this kind of like network of actors, of people and things. Um, and that I think is, is the key to understanding the politics of digital media. It's not at the level, happening at the level of content, which would be like saying, are you on Trump.dating or OK Comrade? Are you left or right? Have you got a Ukraine flag in your bio? Are you pro-trans or anti-trans? That's all the level of content. Where the real politics is happening, it's at the level of form. It's how do these systems, these digital systems, arrange us into our bubbles, into our uh, particular uh, social stratas and strands. And those are the things which are designed to, I don't know how, how one would want to put it, you could say that, that that stops us from having a revolution, or you could say that in, its, in itself, this is a revolution. This is my argument, that this, that this is the true revolution that's happened, it's a, and it's an evil one, and it's happening at the level of form. So I guess this also connects to your point. I did do some tick boxing to make sure, and, and loads of that stuff came from suggestions from the publisher and editors, as you can imagine. Um, but, but really for me, the content is not what's important. It's what's actually happening to the structures through which we communicate, and it's about who owns them and how how they're organized and how we are objects within them that's where politics is happening so what, what whatever content we choose to put on our twitter bio or whatever it's, it's kind of meaningless I, I mean? I 100 100 percent agree about the form being so much more important than the content and i'm really into uh McLuhan, really, we're, we're all McLuhan pilled in a sense, you know, uh, we, we, we go beyond him in various ways. Obviously, Baudrillard goes beyond him in various ways. And, you know, we're in a, yeah. our own situation having to think that through. Um, you, Let me give you, one you, really quick, I, funny. I, I, uh, oh, I just, sorry, well, well, I guess we'll, we'll get to my question. I was going to ask about you, uh, but we can come back to him, uh, you know, in a bit. Um, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, no, it was just about one quick funny example of exactly that form content thing. Uh, which okay. was one I was hoping to get in anyway because of your question about the the robot. But it was the we, I mean the, the the actual weirdest experience in my sort of little investigation was not the sex robot, although that did feel weird, but the uh, virtual reality porn. And um, when I went into this, it's a classic example of this form content thing because I was primed as a sort of leftist. You know, uh, I was primed to hate this because you know it's really quite typical i expected it to be uh a certain kind of misogynistic thing or whatever um, and i went in sort of primed to think you know this is going to be bad but i tried to tell myself don't go in with any opinions right just just see how it goes now there's two kinds of vr porn that dominate the market i don't know how much you guys watch of this stuff probably none um but this was probably because you can't afford a headset you know that's the that's the main reason people <laughs> that's the reason i didn't uh, until this point, I suppose. But um, anyway, you, you, you've got two types. One's um, like you're, uh, you're a camera. So basically you put the headset on and you're basically a camera and you're, you're not in the room personally, but you look around the room just like you look around a screen, but uh, you just see it in 3D. The other kind is the POV kind. 
And in some of these things, you quite literally put on a headset and you put on another man's cock and everything. And you see the world from <laughs> the perspective of the thing. And you literally, I mean, one could easily have fun with psychoanalysis about what kind of castration is going on here in this quite literal sense or whatever. But the weird <laughs> thing was, I found it. Obviously, then you're, you're this sort of, you go in there, suddenly you're like some it's like Andrew Tate type doing your sex on these women and so on. Um, uh, from the, and you, you temporarily, get, and so at the level of content, right, I don't think this is particularly helpful or whatever. I would probably criticize the content if I was forced to. But at the level of form, I can honestly tell you, it's a quite astonishing experience where you, you're actually positioned in another type of body and you can see what kind of power technology has over empathy. And without giving away too much about my sort of, you know, although I didn't want to enjoy it, it does kind of work. <laughs> <laughs> in the sense that the technology does have the power as a form to invite you into its space and allow you to desire as another desires that is not your own desires it might you may be gay straight you might like one thing and not another but the technology has the power to sort of put all that aside and invite you into this scene of desire and you can experience as another desires now, I think, and this might sound extreme, I think that's why so many people got behind Brexit or against Brexit. It's not because we really wanted Brexit or not. It's because we're invited by these structures to opt into a thing. That's why Obama's Yes, We Can campaign worked, because you're invited to step into a position where you can experience the desire for something to happen, even if it's got fuck all to do with you and Obama's actually dreadful. So it actually, that technology, the the... the the, the misogynistic VR porn can teach you something about the form and structure of our society and technology that's way more radical than the content itself or whatever. So I thought that was a nice illustration of that kind of point. Yeah, that's a really good example. I, I guess I didn't realize how far the technology had come. My, my, I just wasn't. <laughs> Ordering one there. Yeah, yeah I, oh, <laughs> I already did. Yeah, no, I. I I was in Finland last year with my fiance at the time, and we uh, we were with some friends, and their friend came out uh, to eat with us, and and he was like this really cool guy, like from some grad program they had been in or whatever at college. I don't really remember all of the details, but he was a cool guy, um, and he was talking about how his brother lives in VR and does BDSM shit in v VR, and that's when I first was like. Oh, this is come way further than I knew. Like he lives in it, and he's like, "Yeah, he's like, it's fun. I do it too, but I don't live in it." And I was just like, <laughs> "And he was, wow, well, yeah, yeah." I'm sure there's all kinds of, all kinds of other issues, right? I'm not like a proponent of these things all of a sudden, but <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just, I'm just saying there's there's yeah, these are are uh, yeah, these are interesting you know, potentially sort of philosophical ex experiences, not just like something to dismiss or whatever, especially among, you know, people who think, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, it's important. Again, it goes back to what Nance was saying. I, I think it's important to actually try these things, not just theorize them, because no. you might find you quite different. You're quite surprised. <laughs> no, this is this is great. You know, like I we've already talked about the book I'm writing at Amazon called Work at Amazon. And, you know, I've worked there for uh, twice in two different warehouses and it's it's I, I'm interested more than anything um, in freeing up large energy infused repeatable blocks of time throughout the week for everybody which means time energy which is like the precondition for the good life for being able to have relationships families uh, develop your skill sets experiment with new things that that aren't just consumer experiences but could be like grinding on a violin for a thousand hours you know like that kind of thing is like freedom for me um, and obviously like money is a precondition for that in the way society is currently structured there's a lot of other ways of structuring society uh, a lot of people on the left throughout the last uh, 100 years have uh, had various positions on automation. One position is to scorn it and say that it only ever has taken away skills and you know jobs from people. And of course that's true, but uh, being at Amazon and seeing the robotification of the future uh, has been mind-blowing. Um, and But this 
it, to me, it's like, yeah, it, try to get into the subject matter as much as you possibly can. And you, you got into it, let's just say that. But, you know, it's, you, you, there's a tradition here. Um, going, going back, uh, you know, Simone Vey or Vial, you know, she, she went into factories. Um, you know, Barbara Ehrenreich went into, uh, you know, service work. But, of course, I've just always worked shitty jobs. But have you read Sherry Turkle's book, Alone Together? Um, no, but uh, I did read uh, su- some stuff by her and, and cool. also used it in the book. I, d- I do like the stuff, but I haven't read that. Cool. Yeah, because in that one, she has a lot on this. Uh, it, w- it was one of the first sort of RPG uh, forum kinds of sites where people create an avatar, create a personality. It's all pro felicity, yeah. right? And then what was it called, Nance? It's called. Was it Second Life? It's called Second Life, yeah. 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 People, people were getting married on there and they were cheating on their spouses, right? Um, and so she, of course, spent a lot of time on there. She went and met people and interviewed them and stuff like that. I see what you're doing as like right in that tradition of critical media theory where you are getting to know the subject matter. So, I mean, I don't imagine anybody thinks it's weird. I think everybody is going to be like, that's amazing that you did that. So, uh, you know, props. But uh, I think one of the things, um, since you mentioned... Uh the Sherry Turkle example, I think one of the things that's so interesting about that is how the internet's changed and stuff as well since since then. So that's exactly what I was trying to do, like something in that tradition. But like, you know, she she argues that like um, the I don't this is maybe a little bit. I'm not sure if I quite um, thought this pro- thought process through. So I could be completely wrong. But my instinct and there's there is an interesting article about this by I think Jose Van Dyke. But, you know, in 2009, basically, uh, Mark Zuckerberg gave this speech, which was called, which was titled "You Have One Identity," and that's when um, Facebook started verifying people's identities and making them use their real name, and it, it then brought in the timeline and stuff like that. Whereas what like Turkle was exploring is this kind of like multiple playful identities online or whatever, um, and uh, it was all like more associated with queer theory and experimentation and other kinds of play and desire or whatever, then at a certain point in the history of the internet, this basically gets shut down. um, And then identity becomes this kind of fixed thing. The internet stops being a play space for a queerness of identity or multiplicity of identity. And it starts becoming a commoditized space for marketing one single identity. Now, I don't want to get into something I don't know about, but it, it is interesting that now when you look at, say, maybe examples from the trans community but what comes to mind most strongly would be like those furries where they're like i'm also a cat or whatever Uh, and it's no lot it's not like oh i'm being a cat today it's like i actually am one forever this this speaks Mm -hmm. to the essential quality of my identity in a way that so i I think there's something dangerous that's happened since 2009 which is that we've taken away the uh play to play freedom queerness and replaced it with a sort of you have one commoditized identity thing and it's actually extremely interesting that Zuckerberg basically said it and it happened I mean so this is sort of the, the role of tech in our sort of cultural life or whatever and I think that that long history that like Turkle's part of investigating would be really important and worth sort of flagging you're making me instantly reassess everything I've done with theory underground because uh, it's you know it's not just a course site and publishing house there's a social media aspect to it and we say you know people are encouraged to not be anonymous use your real face uh, but also don't be yourself so of course like I have like put that don't be yourself don't be your full authentic self we don't want to see that you know don't try to be your own full authentic self here but but we are encouraging people to use their face and name. And now I'm like, you know, maybe, 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 yeah, the, the glory days really were when there wasn't this sort of injunction that you had to do that. So that's fascinating. Wow. Uh, yeah, you- I mean, it just, it just um, yeah, exactly. I mean, when I was studying, one of the things that really got me into psychoanalysis, actually, and into all the things, and Marxism, was uh, Lee Edelman, which is like queer theory, basically. And he's yep, yep. sort of critic and pro queer theory. But I, I found that really like useful. And I do think like a lot of the lessons of queer theory seem to be like forgotten. And that like, you know, that it's important to, to sort of remember how that sort of changed. Because on the one hand, we've got, you know, we've got certain discourses of, of you know, we're making progress or whatever, apparently, in, in terms of sexuality and stuff. But, but, but there's actually something 
that's not progressive happening as well going on there. And, and it's important that we don't like close all those queer spaces and insist on this kind of commodified single identity stuff. I think that is probably worth saying, yeah. Yeah, it, it does seem like a, there's a huge gap between um, people who take on gender as a performance and people who take it on as the authentic truth that you need to literally believe and also verbally conform to. And if you don't, then you're literally a Nazi. And so like there is like this, this gap because on the free play side, it's like, yeah, you know, I'm, that's where I came in. Like, so going back to, you know, things were very different in the Bernie Corbin era, you know, in 2016, I was basically a class reductionist workerist, right? Um, and I have lots of problems with class reductionism as well as more importantly, I have bigger problems with workerism, um, you know, because it's, it's its own form of identity politics, blah, blah, blah. It's also easily co-opted by literally anything. It doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't give us jack shit to, doesn't actually deliver. Um, so th th that's, I've got a whole thing on that, but that was in 2016 when I was with Bernie. And of course I was like some kind of a Marxist as well. Um, and then the, I, I, you know, I, I got more and more into like woke spaces because of the organizing. I started networking with more and more uh, w people who were that way. And as a result, I kind of came to this idea like, oh, we need to loosen up like the class reduction inside. It's the, it's we need to loosen up because we need Bernie to win next time and we were part of the problem last time. And, and not only did I loosen up, I started experimenting with my gender. I started using they, them pronouns. I, uh, I had an, an alt account online that w went by a woman's name, even though I wasn't a trans woman, I never was. Um, but it was an experiment. It was just to see how people would treat me, how things, you know, like what, what what's it like to kind of like play with that side of myself that obviously American culture, especially growing up in Idaho, never, uh, appreciated or always kind of suppressed or as Judith Butler says, cause I was really into her at the time, you know, that side of you, <clears throat> who you are in your gender performativity, you think it's natural. You come to feel like it is you. It's natural. You know, it, what's, what's been forced to be normal is made natural. She says that we forget about the part where if you don't comply with that, you get bullied. Right. And so, there was like this big sort of revolutionary like <clears throat> transformation in my in me just being like wow I can get in touch with that, um, but you know in retrospect I also think that I was wanting to be heard and seen and be able to have communication within the university spaces where if you are a white male you're fucked you will not be seen you will not be heard they will not appreciate you but you show up in a dress and okay you can actually talk now and so. Uh, you know that I, I don't think that should reflect on everybody else's experiences. There are obviously uh, people who have had lifelong gender uh, di uh, dysphoria. Like that's a different kind of thing than what I was doing, which was a performance and a way of gender. It's called gender queer, and it's experimental, and it's a lot more like drag or something. Um, and and it's also very phallic. You know, it's extremely phallic when a guy does that because uh, you're saying. Look, I'm so much a man, I can actually negate how much of a man I am, right? And so I became aware of that more, that the phallic-based uh, or the uh, Lacanian uh, position on, on sexuation and everything. Uh, and, and that kind of, uh, I would say, uh, divested me of some delusions at the time. Maybe, I don't know. But I also have a lot of good memories from that time. I don't you know, I don't just say it was it was bad or anything, but also I do think that it didn't change a goddamn thing in terms of political organizing. In fact, I think that we were duped. All of us who thought that we had to play along with the liberal left, every box has to be checked kind of um, form of activism called intersectionality. I I don't believe in that, you know, for sure. And so that's how I've changed. Um, and so in our last, uh, you know, 15 minutes or so here, all three of us maybe, I'd like Nance to also talk a little bit about it. How has um, the, 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 the fallout uh, or the failures of those years um, impacted you? How have you changed in your approach to things? 
Yeah, no, I mean, it's really interesting. I mean, I, I like I said before, I, I know very little uh, and haven't ever studied or thought much about uh, issues of gender. But I, what I have worked on, as you know, is, is the history of the Internet and stuff. And I think your story does kind of in some ways map this kind of tension between the space the, and pro presumably a lot of that or some of that took place in, in and online and perhaps in real life, but mediated through the Internet and so on. And I think that's also a history that's connected to this kind of kind of stuff. So really, it's really interesting to hear um, your own sort of version of that tale. Um, so, yeah, I mean, let, let me just say then, um, yeah, I did I did think a bit before this about what I'd want to say about the position of the left today, um, because I'd say not that I was totally duped, but that um, at the time when I uh, was doing that book and, and the previous one, um, you know, uh, it was um, in the say of what I usually think of as the sort of Corbyn and Trump years, um, partly because I'm British, um, but partly because um, I think you know, in some ways Trump is the a better comparison with Corbyn than Bernie in the weirdest way. Um, but in any case, I, I perceived those years as um, a, a time when there was opportunity for the left and, and where the left might consider itself as being sort of having an opening to get back into real politics, you know, with a capital P or whatever. And I think you saw it, it was more, that's probably more true, much more true in the case of Corbyn than it is in the case of Sanders. But obviously the, the comparison with Trump is that that allowed, that, that was a moment like, a comparable moment for some factions of the right. And I think that those years were sort of characterized by this sort of, um, yeah, sense of opportunity, even in our failure, because although it, it seemed to be uh, the right that was actually getting into government, it looked like the establishment was cracking up and that therefore the left had as much chance of the right, or at least a, a, a chance worth betting on, that it could do uh, something in that crack. Um, so the typical reading, and then then when, when obviously then when... Uh, Trump and Corbyn were replaced by Keir Starmer and Joe Biden. Uh, and the same pattern you can see with what happened with Mel and Sean in France and now the, 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 the rise of the right uh, in other places in Europe. Um, then you, you, the typical uh, response would be, well, an opportunity has been missed. The crack has closed and corporate capitalism, mainstream politics has sort of regained its hold. You know, capitalist realism takes hold again kind of thing. Uh, and I think that's that was what I thought for a little bit for part of the story. But if if you were to ask where do I think um, there's opportunity for the left in this very say depressing moment after these defeats, it would be that we we um, now have to face the fact that being anti-fascist, being anti-right wing, did not help us. Right in in the sense that we were basically told by the center by the whatever we want to call this group of people the the, lib, the liberals the neoliberals the established politicians the center the mainstream whatever these are all shit words for it but they'll do for now we were basically sold the concept that the rise of the right was such a threat that we had to move uh, in line with our allies uh, in the more normal mainstream center otherwise the fascism would come and we would be fucked so we did it, basically. I, I didn't myself, I voted, well, I didn't in my voting do it, but, you know, I, I was tempted, as, as you say, you can see it in the style of writing in my book, that, you know, there was part of this temptation, I was sort of tempted in this direction as well. Um, and now, so we did that, we got Biden, we got uh, rid of Trump, we got rid of Jeremy Corbyn, we got rid of the, the right and the left, Mel and Sean, we got rid of some, and then, but then for, for a moment, we moved back to the middle. And now what are we looking at? We're looking at Again, the same kind of horrible, extreme, horrible corporate capitalism, war, uh, we're looking at and the, a rise of the right again across Europe uh, and possibly in other places, possibly the return of it in the UK and in America. I don't know. I don't really even know what the right means in this context. But what we can say is that taking this uh, anti-fascist position did not get rid of fascism. Right. This 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 coming in line thing. It actually seems to have helped and bolstered the cause of the right. So where are we now as as leftists or even if that's the word we want to use? But we maybe are in a position of opportunity because we have to now confront the fact that getting into bed with the, you know, falling for this, you know, threat of the the, the rising right uh, and, and coming into bed with the center in order to prevent this thing happening. That doesn't work for us. So we've now got to find a, another direction, I think. You know, surely the left's going to have to rethink what it is now because we can see that that hasn't worked. That hasn't improved the situation for people all across the world. So we've got to try a different tactic than that. Right? And of course, you know, I'm not saying we were all, I'm sure we're all 
you know, I mean, it's, we're all anti-fascist. I mean, it's even the most stupid phrase, isn't it? I mean, it's like saying, are you good? You know, <laughs> we, we, you know but, well, but they, that tactic didn't work. You know? <laughs> they use it, they use it to try to, they, they always say, oh, you know, someone like Hassan Piker or Vosh, like, the, you know, the, they'll, they'll, they'll laugh at someone who says that they're anti-antifa and they'll say, you know what that means to be anti-antifa. It's, it's anti-fascist. So you're saying that you're anti-anti-fascist. Two, two negatives makes a positive. You're just saying you're fascist. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, that would be true if we were talking about math or logic, but we're talking about the English language. And it turns out that in English as well as in most other languages, uh, two negations don't necessarily make a positive. You can be, you can be uh, against fascism and also against Antifa because both of them fucking suck. Right. Like both of them <laughs> fucking suck. And uh, like uh, there was a time when I was, you know, making fun of Tim Pool was, you know, one of my shticks on what I was doing as an influencer. You know, it's like embarrassing to think back to because I mean, like the guy, I don't know that he's got a lot going on in there. He's not the brightest crayon or whatever, but he's reacting to genuinely concerning things. Um, and when we uh, I'll just speak for myself or I, the, me, I'm not saying us, but I'm saying like the, the part of the thing that I was a part of uh, uh, would focus on, you know, these idiots who are so easy to dunk on. We forget that the people who are tuning in workers with earbuds who are like, well, that looks scary and stupid and not good. Um, if the only people addressing it are Dave Rubin and Tim Pool and Andrew No or and Jordan Peterson, if they're the only people willing to address it head on and say that's bullshit, well then they're given a monopoly on truth. Like the, the monopoly on truth is being given to them. And it's, it doesn't have to be. You know, it's really easy actually now to kind of take this position and say, uh, that's also that's stupid. They're dumb, but so is that. You know? But also I don't like this uh approach and this is why I don't have a channel that's just like dunking on Antifa saying uh, or you know I don't believe in dunking really it's a uh, you know the the the, the dunk uh, industrial complex I think whatever it is that you are against um, it's really good for getting a following like you could be someone like Thought Slimer or Noah Sampson and you could or you could have uh, you know a hundred thousand of, of subscribers and uh, you've got like a, a choir that you're preaching to by making examples of idiots. Um, but this is an argument I've been having with the Solitariat for years is that you don't convince anyone except for that choir when you dunk because a person who goes, yeah, but they kind of have a point or even if I disagree with them, I also say stupid things and you would probably just dunk on me if we talked long enough. What you're doing at the level of the, the egoic relation is you're burning bridges with most people who aren't 100% bought in with a thousand different things. And so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, I think, and this is the very last thing really, I think that in a nutshell, and you know, I, I think that if, you know, there's, if I had to just have one sort of comment on it, it would be that to, to solve the problems today, we need to not think in sort of oppositional terms, right? So Eve, whether, whether you're talking about you know, anti-fascist and fascist wokes or anti-wokes, Israel or Palestine or whatever. This sort of thinking, this kind of like oppositional thinking is precisely what's not needed um, to, and it, and it alienates everyone because it makes it look like, you know, it's Bre we mentioned in this conversation, Brexit or not, Trump or not, you know, we, we've obviously had this sort of oppositional logic to things for, for a long time. And I, surely we can just look at the world around us today whether we look at our working conditions or what goes on in war zones or whatever, and just say, this isn't working, right? This isn't working. So going to protests and following the same oppositional logic, we've tried this and it isn't stupid to do. It's fine to empathize with people and want to support them. We, we don't want people getting hurt. We, we, could, we I do support, like you said, I, 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 you know, we, can, we want to support everyone. We want to support workers. We want to support people in, Palestine and Israel we want to support trans people we want to do that that but we have to do that without being oppositional because all that does is alienates everyone makes people hate each other and it's precisely what got us into this mess so we've got to find a way and I'm just saying I guess this would be my point about the left the left has has become fairly oppositional and I think it's now at a point where maybe we can look at the world around us and say okay that hasn't worked 
And so you identify as a universalist. Well, I mean, I, I really uh, have always thought of myself as part of the left. And the, the sort of motto of Sublation magazine, which I like, is sort of critiquing the left from the left, um, which I like as a, as a motto because uh, too much of a, too, we're too inclined, as, as I said, to think oppositionally, to think of ourselves as the pure subject and the other as the problem. So we're just slagging off the, the enemy and not ourselves. It is important to see that we're all complicit we're all guilty, we're all subjects who are part of the problem here. Uh, so to me, the idea of being a leftist who critiques the left as well as critiques the capitalists and the right is, a, is an attractive, probably I'd describe myself as that. With the pamphlets, I did describe it as universalist because I think this is also something we kind of need. And uh, it's why I'm attracted to psychoanalysis is I think that, I know psychoanalysis gets told off often for being too male, too elitist and too white. But for me, actually at its best, Psychoanalysis describes what are the structures that we all share, even if we've got different bodies, identities, genders, we still have things in common and searching for those things can be a point of solidarity where we can start building uh, a better future together. So, yeah, I'm attracted to the word universalists, but I still see myself as a leftist, only one that thinks the left is also part of the problem. I guess. <laughs> nice. That, I'm rolling the applause there. I think we love that. Love that. Um, I, I know. I know. I had said I wanted to, Nance to be able to say something as well. I'm gonna step away. You will not see me for a second, but Nance, I can hear you. And if you want to just take the floor for a couple of minutes, share out how things have changed for you as well, points of agreement or disagreement with the two of us, and whatever, then we'll close out. Yeah, I think. Uh, I think right now, and maybe like the last couple of decades, have been really good for um, people who are invested in, I don't know, the, the structures and systems that, that currently exist, like all the conflict and all the backs and forths have really benefited um, structures that have already been in place and, and that like will continue to persist. So all the like, I don't know all the bullshit conflicts we get invested in and, and all the online warfare and the meme wars and, and shit like that. Like it's not really accomplishing anything. Um, we're spinning our wheels in place. And I like personally, I, I think I was not super invested in it. Um, like I was busy working. I didn't have time to go online and argue with people. I didn't, make memes and, and shit like that. But I was invested in, in the idea of, oh yeah, I'm a leftist. Um, I used, you know, I used to call myself an anarchist and then a Marxist. And then I settled on, oh, it, it doesn't really matter. I'm some kind of communist. Um, but that was always like in reference to a conflict or, or like an opposition. Like that was always very oppositional. Like, well, yeah, of course I'm a leftist because Again, I'm an anti-fascist, so um, that just kind of reifies it again. It, existing structures, and I think I don't know since 2016, 20, 2017, um, maybe maybe I went through a period of like just total black pill and and being just like fuck it, everything sucks, we're all fucked, um, nothing matters. And then coming through that on the other side, like I, I, I think it's important to maintain a little bit of that black pill, like, cause I think we currently are fucked. And, and I think if we cling to the things that got us where we are, we will stay fucked. Um, so I think we have to like, look up from what we got going on and, and try to, I don't know, reimagine, um, who we are um and not in reference to opposition not in reference to in group out group like in reference to like well who am i and what does that really mean and what do i desire and how am i being led around by that desire and kind of locked into these false binary positions um we really have forgotten how to think dialectically and like we the left and and stuff like that and um I don't know, maybe I'm huffing my own farts, but it, it does seem like there are a lot of people that are coming around to that position as well. 
Um, so it's exciting. Like maybe, like Alfie, you said, maybe there is a, a, a new opportunity now because everyone realized, no, we can't do this lesser, lesser evilist. Um, maybe that is a, an opportunity. Um, maybe there is a reason to hope. I don't know. Yeah, I think I also don't. I mean, I also don't know. Uh, no. But I think if I was to try to be hopeful, that's where I'd go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Well, thank you both for being here for this segment. Everybody, we will be back shortly with Cadell Lass and Owen Cox to talk about the new Dark Age and some of the experimental organizing events that they are doing right after uh, this. Take care, guys. Okay, that was stupid. Uh, why is it not working? Three, two, one. All right, right after, <laughs> right after this. Thinking is super uncool, and that's why you should do it. It's just like almost anything that's like cool anymore. Um, yeah, it just sucks. And I think that's like what the underground movement has always been about, is just like seeing what's in the mainstream, being like it ain't there and kind of like cobbling something together, you know? And, and yeah, it's a little mismatched, but that's like its beauty. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, where workers with earbuds can find genuine liberation from necessity. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time energy theory, critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. We bring primary texts from leading lights of diverse fields to bear on topical issues and works popular in our current world. Theory Underground is a publishing house as well as lecture course and social media platform. You've been reading Underground Theory. Yes. And, uh, Amazing book. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run a review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best editing collection I've ever read. Jesus Christ. Seriously. This is a little experiment in what I, David McCarricker, can pull off without relying on the academy or the algorithmic dictates of the attention economy. Usually a good edited collection has good essays, but you only want to read a few. Every essay makes me want to read the other essays because you have a vision. Everyone that you invited, you invited for a reason. You weren't some fake publicist. He's like, hey, someone says a new book, have them on your show. No, you only talk to people because you've read shit by them that you've right, thought right, about, that right. you think has value, even if you disagree. So I think that's what's amazing. I believe that I am, like so many others, pioneering a future in which educators can form learning webs that will make learning as a way of life enjoyable and emancipatory. However, before these tools become accessible, they have to be experimented with. That's why I built my own website and app using nothing more than my own saved wages, five patrons, and some small classes of students over the last year. Of course, I also have had my wife Anne's moral support and help with accounting so that I don't get in trouble with the IRS or whatever. In less than a year, Theory Underground has already put out eight courses, two books, one, my book, Time Energy, and the other, Underground Theory, which has over 30 contributors, including works written by students at Theory Underground, some of my fellow travelers, and colleagues in the broader universe of underground theory. Beyond the books and courses, though, you will also find interviews, reading exegetical reaction sessions, and live weekly events for working class autodidacts, independent researchers, and renegade academics. These include a variety of clubs and cohorts that meet on a weekly or monthly basis. If you want to get involved, there are four main subscription levels. Think of it like a gym membership, but for your mind. The point is to make learning, practice, and theoretical comprehension a way of life. Support at this stage of the operation is more crucial than ever because my savings were used up over the last year of getting this established. If I can triple my subscribers in the next two months, I can quit my gig at Amazon and focus on this work full time. All I need is a few more people at each of the levels 
or a couple big time patrons who just want to see it happen. Right now I am doing a patron and site subscriber drive, so excuse the commercial. But if you end up really liking what goes on at this channel, consider signing up soon. If you cannot afford it, but want to get involved with some of the stuff behind the paywall, I have made a financial aid scholarship you can sign up for here in the description. Quick side note, some people ask about the profit motive. At this point, I have not actually made a return on any of my investment in terms of the amount of time energy that I put into things, the amount of savings I've actually put into things, the opportunity cost of the work that I'm doing as opposed to the other kinds of things that I could be doing for money. Uh, but more importantly, I don't actually make enough to pay for my cost of living. The goal is to make enough for my cost of living. And then once that is achieved, everything over that amount is going to go towards expanding the operation to the point where I can hire Michael Downs, AKA Mikey of The Dangerous Maybe, to be a full-time researcher and part-time teacher at Theory Underground. All right, so with that aside, I just wanna say also, if you are a worker with earbuds, what's up? I see you. I work at Amazon part-time and everything I do is for my past self who used to work there full-time. Most workers with earbuds couldn't care less about theory, but I do believe a working class intellectual revolution could grow out of the underground theory scene. My hope is that what I have built here will contribute to making the scene something more than just a scene and you into something more than just a scene kid. We're trying to make this into a real intellectual milieu capable of leading a way forward beyond the imminent crises facing humanity. But for that, we need thinking now more than ever. Start thinking. I hope that you either will or have enjoyed the program and also make sure to like, comment, subscribe and leave this playing in the background all the time while you're doing other things. Playing long form theory underground content in the background while you do things has, in the near future, been scientifically proven to emancipate minds from the functional illiteracy imposed on workers by the structural stultification of time energy. This is achieved by re-territorializing circumspective concern. Also, to some degree, it is for the algorithm. Think of it like a gym membership, but for your mind! <laughs> I love, you so much. Yeah, I love you too. Just want to make a quick shout out here at the end to my patrons over at Patreon. I set the Patreon up like a week and a half ago because the fact is not everybody wants to be a subscriber at my website. Not everybody wants to take courses at the website. And so if you, people who are looking to support in some other way, Patreon is kind of a tried and true route and some people really prefer it. And so to those who are becoming patrons at my Patreon. Thank you so much. If I can get up to $500 per month between people over at my website and people over at the Patreon and people over at the Substack collectively, I will be able to quit the job at Amazon and do this full time. And so to the people who just started trying to make that possible over at Patreon, special shout out to Alexander, Neil, Darian Large, and Nikolaj. You guys are really helping make the difference. Really appreciate it. And to anybody who becomes a subscriber or a patron here in the next month, I just want to say you get a free copy of my new book, Time Energy, Why You Have No Time or Energy. And uh, you really incentivize me to get the audio recording of this finished, which I've been working on. So thank you. Take care, everybody.